Hi, Riti. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time and joining this webinar today. We are here to discuss a super interesting topic on mastering the art of global hiring in a borderless world. I am Supriya. I will be your host today and I manage product marketing at Multiplier. Uh, we are joined by a supremely diverse panel as well, going to the spirit of the topic. And uh, we have with us Bamsi Krishna, who is the CPO at Multiplier and Jake Parrish, the CEO of Innovex and Peter Earnshaw, the Senior Vice President of Global Revenue at Fairmark. Uh, in this webinar today, we'll discuss some key factors to consider when planning, you know, to hire globally and how you can effectively manage a global team. Uh, also to look at, you know, the legal regulations that you have to, you know, cater to and look to for, you know, hiring in different countries. Uh, the tools and technologies that can be used to, you know, facilitate, facilitate this process for yourself and also some real life anecdotes and examples from the panelists themselves. So that's pretty much what we'll be covering today. Uh, quickly, before we start, we'll go through a round of introductions. Uh, Vamsi, would you like to go first? So, my name is Vamsi. I'm a co-founder and uh, chief product officer at Multiplier. Uh, <clears throat> so, at Multiplier, we are a global employment platform. We help companies hire uh, distributed workforces uh, in any country within a few minutes without having to set up their own entities, figure out the compliance and labor regulations, or open their bank accounts. Um, I handle all of our technical products uh, and the roadmap. And uh, yeah, super excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jake, would you like to go? Yeah, thank you. Thanks to see everyone. Uh, I'm Jake, founder of Innovex. Uh, Innovex is a global executive search fund. Uh, we help scale up technology and data driven businesses and also the FTSE 100 um, secure C suite and leadership hires uh, globally. Uh, geographies include Central and Eastern Europe, um, East Coast, West Coast, US, um, APAC and the Far East, and um, of course, the UK. Awesome. Uh, Peter, could you share some details? Yeah, hi, I'm Peter. I'm the head of the commercial function at Airmark. We are a background screening vendor that operates across the globe to provide organizations with the ability to check the credentials of their staff, focus on remote workforces. And I've been doing this for the best part of 20 years. So hopefully I can share some of that experience with you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so before we get started, just for everybody who's joined the webinar, We'd like to keep this as interactive as possible, so feel free to post your question as and when you have one on the chat. Uh, we'll also include a few poll questions in between the sessions so that we understand where you're coming from, some opinions and inputs from you guys as well. Uh, so to kickstart the session today, we have a couple of questions and I'll sort of go through the panel and share my questions with each of them. Uh, the first one will be for you, Wamsi. Uh, you know, being at Multiplier, what do you think uh, are key factors that HR directors and managers should consider when they hire globally? Right. All right. Um, very, very, uh, very good question, uh, Supriya. So at Multiplier, uh, you know, for quick context, we have uh, helped thousands of companies set up their distributed workforces uh, in about 90 plus countries at the moment. Uh, we are live in uh, 150 plus countries and uh, we can, uh, we, we, in, we, we help companies hire uh, in all of these countries wherever we are live in uh, at the click of a button. So, so far from our experience, what we have seen is that there are uh, three main uh, topics to uh, consider when you hire someone internationally. The first and foremost being, how do you handle all of the legal and regulatory requirements of that specific country, uh, the labor law compliance of that specific country, and how do you navigate that? because every country is different uh, and you need to be fully aware uh, before you uh, hire and onboard anyone. The second is uh, finding the right recruitment partner uh, who can help you hire that resource uh, in that country uh, so that you know you 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 get the right candidate for your role uh, at a reasonable price. And, uh, and finally, um, how do you 
set up the right salary and benefits package, which is on par uh, with what is generally provided in that country for that role. So, and and obviously all all of these three are uh, super important uh, before you get started with international hiring. Uh, so, and 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 to quickly also share uh, what what we do at Multiplier. Uh, firstly, you know, from a legal and compliance standpoint, that are, that's our bread and butter. Uh, we have local entities set up in every country that we operate in. Uh, local bank accounts open locally compliant employment contracts that are available on the platform. Uh, we take care of the entire payroll and statutory compliance uh, on our end. And uh, so whenever someone wants to hire, they they don't need to worry about learning all of these because it's 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 a it's quite complex and uh, the risk of error, risk of you making an error is is quite uh, costly. So uh, finding the right employment partner or an employer of record is key to manage that risk. Um, and second and third points as well, uh, we do help uh, from a, a finding a recruiter standpoint. Uh, we work with multiple uh, recruiters across the world, uh, specific to certain roles, specific to certain geographies. All of them are available on our website uh, in the talent marketplace section. And obviously, uh, having have having been the platform of choice for thousands of employees across the globe, uh, we have unique salary insights uh, of what is the average and uh, uh, what are the averages for a certain role in a certain country, for example, right? Uh, these salary ins insights and benefits insights are also extremely important for you to make a competitive offer uh, to your new hire. So I would say these three uh, form the crux of uh, international hiring. Awesome. Uh Jake, given that, you know, uh, Innovex also helps with sourcing and hiring and stuff like that, would you would you add to any of those points or do you feel like you resonate with any of what Monsi just said? Yeah, I think a big thing here, which which Ramsey also mentioned, is is readiness. Um, so, you know, before we even kickstart in a hiring frenzy internationally, are we ready to do this, you know, from a, a regulatory and compliance perspective? Um, but also are all the stakeholders on the same page in who we're looking for and how they're going to align to the culture internationally. I think that's a really important factor and massively agree. Taking a data-driven approach is absolutely essential. If you haven't hired in a country before that you've set a legal entity in, you need to understand what the salary landscape looks like. So a platform such as Multiplier or an exec search firm like Innovex can provide real-time data with salary brackets that you can consider um, so that you're, you're making sure that you're not going to overpay for someone if you haven't had a good representation of the market already. Very true. Uh, that brings me to the next question, right? So I know that when we are hiring globally, it's super important and essential to be objective and avoid bias. Uh, so Peter, how does, you know, Vermark sort of navigate through this and ensure that you know there's no bias coming in during the process of like same background checks for candidates yes so we think that we're at the so what we're trying to do is foster trust between the employee and the employer so with your existing employees trust them because you've got the data points around their page along your business the things that they've delivered for you when you're bringing something new on, especially somebody remote that you may have found through the Jake's business or through the multiplier business, um, you don't have that data around what they've done previously. So it doesn't give you the basis for trust. So what we do is we set up a process that allows you to create trust. And we apply that to everybody that comes through without bias. So we are not saying that we are favoring you based on gender or any other characteristic. We have an objective and subjective criteria that everybody has to go through. It's uniform. And the intent is to foster trust between the employee and the employer. And we pre present that data for you so that you can make that decision. So that's how we find the companies that we work with that work in a variety of different markets can have the same trust for every employee, regardless of where you are. 
that's awesome. I think a process around trust is is not something that's spoken about as often and is is super critical in, you know, uh, portions of hiring and especially when you're talking to people of different cultures and different languages. Um, amazing. So I think the, along these lines, we'd love to hear about what the audiences face as a challenge or any of the other factors that they look at while they are hiring, you know, globally. And that will be like a poll question that is shared as well. So feel free to like share your comments and inputs on the chat. Uh, Fancy, you did that point. Just to quickly add on uh, Peter's point, uh, I absolutely agree. At, at, we are we are big believers in distributed workforces. I think that's the only way uh, to hire if you want to set up an A-class team. You have to hire in multiple geographies uh, and, and whoever is the best fit for that role. And and uh, trust is a massive challenge. Uh, how can you... How can you... Uh, someone who you have never met uh, who is in a completely different country from where you are uh, and, and you have no idea uh, what their background is. How do you trust someone like uh, so totally new to integrate into your workforce? I think it's a massive challenge to be solved. And and uh, and I believe platforms like Veramark, like do that very well. Um, and, and most importantly, we ourselves use Veramark. And most importantly, I feel like they do it in a way that doesn't ruin the candidate's experience uh, because you want to start from a place of trust um, rather than a, uh, the other way around, right? So I think uh, we complement each other very well, uh, Peter. That's all things. Uh, once you did touch upon like legal, legal and regulatory aspects, you know, when we when we discussed about factors that you know HR people should consider. But uh, what are some of the considerations that? you know, HR professionals should be aware uh, just from a legal and regulatory standpoint, you know, in terms of, say, some laws or work permits and visas and other things like that. If you please. Yeah. I think that's a very, very complicated topic, uh, Supriya, but I'll try to I'll, I'll try to touch upon some of the important aspects um, in, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, so first and foremost, uh, every country has certain rules uh, from all the way from something as simple as what is the minimum number of paid leaves you are supposed to provide uh, to your new hire. There is a statutory minimum in many, many countries, all the way to something as complex as country-specific bonuses that you'll have to provide um, and uh, the kind of tax labs, uh, the kind of statutory contributions and mandatory benefits that you have to provide. Uh, take, uh, take an example of someone who is based out of the U.S., running a business out of the U.S., finds a great engineering talent in, say, Indonesia, and they want to hire them. Uh, but the employer wouldn't have any idea that there is a mandatory THR bonus that has to be provided in Indonesia, uh, and it's a legal requirement. Uh, it's also called a 13-month bonus. And, and failing to pay that can put you in trouble, right? <clears throat> and... Uh, and every country is different. Every country has so many nuances to it. Um, so it's very important to sort of get a full picture of the compliance landscape in a particular country before you make an offer. Uh, and many times the candidates may not tell you that too. Um, uh, and, and you may miss something. So I think it's a super complex area. Uh, <clears throat> our suggestion always is to uh, utilize someone who is a professional, um, someone who is an employer of record, uh, similar to Multiplier or, or, or anyone else for that matter, uh, who has done the groundwork of going into each country, uh, figuring out these legal requirements uh, and, and can help you set up the offer in the right manner. Uh, I, I hope that answers that question. But like I said, it's a massively complex topic and I'm, I'm happy to elaborate more to anyone uh, who wants to know more? Right. Like, yeah. uh, we, can... We've had that with the background check industry in that there's 157 different data privacy legislations that we have to comply with. And some of them operate outside of the jurisdiction, such as the European Union, GDPR, and actually the soon-to-be-released Digital Data Protection Act in India. So if somebody presents themselves and they are a subject, as in a citizen 
of a specific country, they may be governed by a different set of legislation to the one that you're processing them in. And so we, you have to be sensitive. So you need to make sure that you're working with organizations like Multiplier that can guide you through that, organizations like Bearmark that have sort of compliance engines in the back end of the system so that you can't inadvertently try and order something that's not a late, legally allowed. So, for example, here in Singapore, you can't do a police background check. So the system will not allow you to order one. If you say, I do police background checks, that person's in Singapore, it will actually grey it out and say, you can't do this. What you can do is look for trust signals in court records or social media searching or other alternatives to that trust point that you're, you're looking for. Yeah, that, I think those are some inputs which will come only with like a lot of experience and, you know, even for people navigating this for the first time, should go through a lot of research, uh, you know, to be thorough in terms of what legal regulations are there in each country. Uh, that being said, I think we'd love to also just hear from everybody in the audience uh, about any of the legal considerations you guys have encountered uh, while hiring globally, and we'll also share a poll question regarding that. Uh, that being said, now that we are vouching so much for, you know, cross-border hiring and global hiring, it, it boils down to also making a company culture because now you're now you're working with a diverse group of people, uh, people with different habits and different cultures. Uh, and and each country also has a certain way of working, uh, which is which is very implicit in nature, right? It doesn't necessarily get shared and people don't vocalize that this is a certain habit that they have. Uh, Jake, how do you think that, you know, companies can maintain a good culture once, you know, they start to hire across the globe? Because... Again, people are working from different time zones, different backgrounds. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's two elements here. I think um, that there's an area which we call kind of pre-landing. So before um, someone's actually landed in a position that you're hiring for. Um, and really, that we're talking about kind of building trust. Really, it's around careful hiring. Um, it's not just about if someone can do the job and have a skill set fit, but how will they align with the business goal and also with their peers? Um, will they add to the company culture or will they put it at risk? Um, a panel approach to hiring can be a really effective way to combat this. However, as I said recently, at the same time, ensuring that every stakeholder on that panel is on the same page as who they want to professionally hire and who they think would be a cultural match is absolutely essential before any uh, process kickstarts. Um, secondly, um, hopefully, the business has got a solid company mission and, and values attached to that. Um, so I think it's around um, reinforcing that throughout a hiring process. Um, so it's really important to clearly communicate what your mission is, what the vision is, um, and what the values are of the company. Um, that really makes it easy for the candidate to make sure that the opportunity is right for them as well as them being right for the business. Um, I think it's also important for that to be throughout onboarding practices once the can does land to set the clear expectations um and that that continues to be reinforced regularly um throughout their life cycle at the employer uh during various meetings and gatherings um then you've got post landing so particularly in in remote roles or international roles um it's really important to um get people together and to firstly um promote recognition so once hires are made, recognizing the achievements and the contributions that ensure that everyone's feeling valued and important to the organization, I think it's really important to make sure that you mobilize a proper L&D structure as well. So training accessibility, um, both in person and virtually, is, is really important for coming up with creative solutions that allows everyone to participate regardless of where they're based and what time zone they're in. Um, and then thirdly, I think open communication. Um, you know, particularly in, in times where there's peaks and troughs in, in macroeconomic environments, I think it's really important to clearly communicate where the business is, where the business is going, and what the expectations are from 
the staff in that business. So setting clear direction from leadership, encouraging um, a, a trust environment, which is very much based on opus, open and honest conversations, uh, which enables both the employees and, and managers to have the opportunity to stay, take stock of their work and whether it's aligning to, to the business goals. Um, clearly, there's a lot more here, but these are some of the common mistakes that we see in both the pre-hiring and then post-hiring of, of an individual and whether it's a success or not for the company culture and the company as a, as a whole. Awesome. Uh, Bumsi, Peter, would you like to add to that considering, you know, we're all part of global teams at this point. Uh, anything that you see, it has been like a key driver to culture and something that always has to be reinforced. Yeah. I think uh, I see it as a uh, game of repetition, um, especially when it comes to making sure uh, your culture values are being communicated to and and measured and uh, and and everyone is aligned. Um, when in a in a fully remote setting, obviously multiplier is like uh, we are a fully remote company with uh, employees in twenty five different countries uh, and growing, and obviously. Uh, Many of the uh, employees today prefer to be uh, either in a fully remote or a hybrid setting, and you have to adapt your approach uh, to to sort of like facilitate that. Um, and then uh, we discovered that uh, what works best for us is to keep repeating what your values are, uh, to keep showing examples of uh, folks who have embodied those values, uh, and 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 keep doing that uh, repeatedly. If you are in a office setting, obviously you get to meet each other, you get to exchange stories in an informal setting, uh, and there's a lot of uh, knowledge that gets shared uh, organically. But you have to sort of force that in a remote setting, uh, and you have to really plan it and 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 keep doing it. Right. So uh, I think that that that's something that worked for us. Yeah, very right. true. So repetition is key because you have people joining in at different points in time as well. Uh, so it becomes crucial to just keep everybody aligned to the company culture. Uh, Peter, would you like to add anything on this? Yeah, I think one of the things that's often overlooked is the um, requirement for you to refresh your company culture as you grow. Because as you change, as you enter such as multiplier, where they enter into many more markets and, and introduce a new um, cohort of talent into the business, and the same with Veramark, we're in in multiple countries um when we add new people in they add to the culture so culture is not static it is something that evolves with the business and you need to also unlearn behaviors that worked and worked in a uh, an earlier setting with your business that maybe don't scale um the 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 tenants of your culture will always be the same but it's just how you communicate those how you um, embody those in the way in which you work will change as you grow your business into new environments and when you add new people in that add and enrich your culture yeah i think very fair point right the fact that it's evolving is something that people also need to acknowledge and accept and the minute it becomes rigid or static is where you sort of see things breaking uh that being said i think Global hiring today also requires a lot of uh, research and tools and technologies to sort of help even HRs and managers manage this team, right? In terms of, say, an HRM with software or something of that sort. Uh, Peter, are there any uh, inputs that you'd like to share specifically on what tools and technologies are available to facilitate this process for you know global hiring and team management? Yeah, so, so obviously multiply um is 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 a, is a great um base we use that ourselves for in different locations um it, it really goes into making sure that if you are remote um you have to have something that allows participation um across the environment and the countries that you that you operate in and you don't create boundaries um what we look for is something that can be universally adopted something which is um super easy to use from the employee perspective so that there's very little training like nobody has ever taught how to use an iphone right it's intuitive and and so we look for 
software and product-led businesses uh, that embody that so that people just use it and there's, there's no training. The thing that we look for is also interoperability. So something that is part of an ecosystem. It's very difficult. We're, we're a small business. We're in the, in the, you know, the low hundreds, um, as, as a business, uh, but we're widely distributed and we don't want to lock in on certain elements because we're growing so fast and what works for us today is not necessarily going to work for us tomorrow. And so we don't always look for a one size fits all system that does too many things. We look for things which are much more part of an ecosystem. You know, we look for people, uh, organizations, it can be software, it can be services like what Jake's uh, company provide uh, alongside the software, um, that help you to, uh, access, um, excellence. That's what we look for. We really look for people that do something that absolutely you could do this for all of the, the panel that's here today as an, as a company, you could do it yourself. You're just not going to do it as well because you're not going to be specialized in that area. You're not going to be able to put the resources into that to be able to deliver that excellence um, that an organization and individuals can do when they concentrate. And so when we look for our providers, we look for people that have that excellence and that focus to be able to deliver something to us that we could never deliver ourselves because we just are not specialist in that area. So that's what I think you should look for when you're looking for partners, look at the ecosystem, look at what else you can do. Um, you know, when you work with Jake or you, you work with Ramley and the, um, and the Verma, um, and multiplier teams, what else is there in that ecosystem that will plug and play and give you excellence in those areas so that you can have a go to market for your business without having to go out there and try and find lots and lots of different things that don't work together. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Jake, would you would you like to add to that? Any tools that you want to like literally point out and say that these are three things that managers or HR leaders should consider, you know, given that they have to manage a global team? Yes. I mean, firstly, I think it's um, amazing how many technology companies don't invest in technology um, at all. So I think that's the first thing. So I would just encourage you to, to look at the market and see what can facilitate your processes and actually save you time, which can then focus on you doing your day job and making more money for the company, essentially. Um, I think that's a big thing. I think um, exactly what, what Peter says, there's an ecosystem here. There's loads of partnerships in place with um, companies like Multiply, Innovex, and Verimark, where you know, we, we can work together through a trusted source to get the end result. Um, so if, if I'm kind of, yeah, pointing some examples, um, I think um, collaboration platforms, L&D platforms are absolutely essential um, for when people do land. Um, but uh, background check platforms um, are really essential. Um, a lot of people try and do references themselves. Um, and I also think, out, obviously, outsourcing services such as headhunting um, can really um, save some time and, and hopefully make you some more money in the employer as well. Awesome. Bamsi, uh, would you like to add to that? I think um, it's uh, very well covered uh, already. Uh, but I, I also I also think that uh, the ecosystem is evolving rapidly. Everyone is uh, uh, collaborating. There's a lot of uh, integrations available uh, with almost any kind of HR software uh, and software that you take. So I think the the options are out there um, and, and everyone should uh, do their own research and figure out the right tool for their uh, for their setting. Sounds good. Uh, lastly, I think we all come with like a lot of experience in our own fields uh, and there, there definitely are a lot of lessons and anecdotes uh, wherein we learned something or it's been a challenge and uh, it's something that we could navigate through. Uh, Jake, just to start with you, uh, could you share like an example of a successful global hiring initiative and any lessons that, you know, Innovex or you personally uh, got to learn from that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I've, I've got two, there's loads of examples, but there's two in particular, I think that, that speak really well to 
um, our experience and, and how we can help. So going on the structure that I set before with um, hiring readiness, um, there's an example with a business that was called Avast, uh, now called Gen, um, so FTSE business, cybersecurity company. Um, they had a, um, a campaign to hire a thousand people in a year internationally across more than 50 countries. Um, so that was what the board sent down to the organizational design team and also to the CHRO to try and make happen. Um, they weren't ready for that. They were not set up to, to do that whatsoever. Um, I had known the CHRO for around seven years. I'd worked with her successfully at other FTSE organizations. So she brought me in to, to consult. So essentially what we did was provide a consult um, consultation of a period of six months um, that involved going through um, their entire entirety of their talent acquisition organizations, understanding what was there, what wasn't there in terms of people, processes, systems, um, and also internal SLAs with hiring managers. We had to make significant improvements and almost rebuild um, that talent organization um, alongside me hiring a new global head of talent organization. Um, and post that, we needed to ensure as I said, all systems were there. They, they didn't have a HR system. So we had to implement Workday in four weeks, um, which was incredibly tough as, as it was. So that was another thing that we had to make sure was in place, tag them the correct way. All of the escalations were working properly for all the hiring managers and the talent acquisition team itself. Um, and, and last, I mentioned SLAs. Um, you know, this, this was quite a reactive talent acquisition organization. It needs to be more proactive. If you're going to make a thousand hires in a year, you better make sure that your processes are right, but you're also proactively um, approaching a market and treating your um, hiring managers internally like clients. So we had to instill new SLAs, um, new internal contracts between you know the hiring managers themselves and the talent acquisition team to make that process and time to hire more successful. Um, so lots of work, um, lots of late nights internationally looking at workday in different systems but we managed to do that we onboarded an rpo and i believe they hired 999 out of a thousand people in in 12 months or, or just under so um yeah that was a big big example of, of just getting ready and allowing us to come in pre-hiring to make sure that from an outsider's perspective looking in that they were ready to do that um there's another a quick example of, of a smaller company. So not every organization is going to be at FTSE with that many resources to invest in months and months of, of consulting. Um, we work with an organization called La Paya. They're an ed tech um, business, um, HQ in Amsterdam, around 300 people believe they've just secured their Series B. So they're in scale-up mode. Um, they had a HQ in Amsterdam with no international offices whatsoever. Uh, but they wanted to set up five um, in one month. Um, so we were tasked to hire first hires on the ground um, in, in countries like the UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. Um, we had to provide them with data up front to make sure that they knew exactly what the compensation looked like in those markets. So they engaged just on a um, salary benchmarking exercise to make sure that they understood that market properly. Um, and then we actually executed the searches for them. So through our process, um, I think in four weeks, um, we secured short lists of eight to 10 people in those countries. They ran the interview processes based on the framework that we'd implemented with them, um, made successful hires in those countries. Um, and I think everyone is still there, particularly the, the German country managing director, who's now got a team of 25, um, 18 months later. So um, yeah, two examples of just being ready for it in the first place, um, and then just getting some quick you know, build the car whilst you're driving advice from an external resource to make sure that you can make the, the effective buyers that you can. Yeah, I think uh, a large part of what you said also, it matters that there's process in place for, for all of this because it's it's super easy to just skip steps when you have to scale so fast and so rapidly uh, that, you know, people can forget some process elements and like, probably figure out that these are issues later in the future. So I think that's also critical uh, to everything that you mentioned. Uh, Bamsi, I know that, uh, you know, you also hire globally, you interview people as well across the globe. Uh, any lessons that you've had, say, over the last couple of years from your interactions with candidates? 
Right. Um, I mean, obviously, it has gotten uh, easier over time. Uh, candidates are a lot more open uh, to working uh, for, for international companies. So <clears throat> uh, I would say there are, I mean, yeah, there are quite a lot of learnings, uh, both for multiplier and, and, and our clients and customers as well. Uh, we, we publish a lot of you, you know, case studies on our website. Uh, you know, if, if anyone is interested, I would definitely recommend checking that out. It's multiple learnings across the board, uh, across different company sizes uh, and countries uh, in terms of uh, how international uh, hiring internationally has helped them, uh, uh, both from a revenue standpoint or, or saving cost or, or uh, expansion, um, etc. Uh, specific to multiplier, obviously, we scale pretty fast. Uh, we were only able to do that because we never really restricted ourselves to a certain geography or a country when we hired uh, uh, for all the roles that we had. Um, that's one of the reasons why we were able to hire about 300 plus employees in, in, in less than a year. Um, and uh, we were able to get them set up uh, in, in uh, rapidly. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that, that sort of uh, helps uh, uh, move, move fast at, at, at a reasonable cost. Uh, and, and, and more importantly, uh, hiring the right people uh, uh, is is uh, something that that we have uh, learned and and uh, we have been able to and and we have been like big proponents of it from from day one actually. Awesome, yeah. I think hiring the right people doesn't get the importance that it should. Uh, we're sort of realized it much later, but I think that's super crucial. Uh, Peter, any any closing thoughts or anything that you would like to add uh, as an experience or lesson that you've had to you know, hire? So, so we. We sort of mirror what Amsi was saying there around being able to access global talent, and we, we do that through Multiplier. Um, lessons learned for us is that probably the only thing left um, that is a barrier is time zone. So, you know, you don't hire somebody in South America to work the Nordic shift, right? Um, it's not going to work for you, right? So time zones are the things that we learn are for roles where it requires a lot of collaboration um that's something to watch out for um for other areas um you can cross time zone but there are certain uh, functions in the business which you want to want to restrict yourself to a time zone but it gives you a very broad um scope by being in time zone right um it's not just one country and then the, the two, two examples from our experience with clients so we have a large fintech uh, called Wise uh, that some of you may bank with, uh, excellent uh, business, and they grew very, very fast. And as they came through, they had to hit, they hit the regulations. And they hit the regulations in multiple countries at the same time, but they still had to grow. So it was a, a case of how do you help them to meet um, those requirements and be able to bring all of these people in, but in a way that met the requirements and the multiple requirements of the regulatory authorities in each of the different markets that they're moving into and maintain their rapid growth. So that was um, a, a really big learning for us about how to um, support a, a company where there is a, um, a gate that stops them from doing business or not. And they have to get through that gate. And if you don't, it's not a consequence of you not delivering your service or offering. It's a consequence of them not meeting their goals, right? So with all of us on, on this call, a lot of what the value is that we provide, and Jake did mention this um, on an earlier comment, which is a, freeing you up that time and energy to make money for your business. And if, if I'm C, Jake, myself, our companies, we do our job right, we will allow that business to make the money, to be able to grow their business. We're really there to remove the friction um, from going global, um, to remove the um, black holes where you don't know what you don't know. And you may be lucky, but you may be unlucky, right? If you don't have the professionals on your team that will help guide you um, because they've done it before. So I think my sort of closing remarks are that the um, for going global, you don't go you don't go global by yourself. You go global with your partners, with your ecosystem, 
uh, with your trusted advisors that will help you be successful and meet the business goals of going global. I think those are some great points. I think do it yourself in this case isn't necessarily the best approach. So that's something for you know HR managers to consider as well. Uh, that brings me to sort of you know the end of this this webinar. I think it was super insightful for everybody on this panel as well, and and for the attendees of this webinar. Um, we we'll definitely link the you know platform URLs on the chat so that you guys can go check out anything that you may be interested in, both all Multiplier, Innovex, and Vermark. And you know, happy to answer any questions that you guys we have as well. Please feel free to write to us. Thank you again so much for joining in today and you know have a nice day.